right, y'all. This is another episode of the Puppy Therapy Podcast with your host, Chris. And Ray. Today, we have with us New York Times bestselling author and host of Empowered Wife Podcast, Laura Doyle. And we also have with us Kathy. How are you all doing? Doing great. Yeah. Let me just briefly introduce Kathy. We're so lucky to have her with us today. Okay. She is a master relationship coach and the CEO of Laura Doyle Connect, which is an international relationship coaching company where we have about 40 coaches and we support thousands of women in fixing their relationships. Awesome. So, good to be here. Thanks for having us. No yeah, worries. You you, I know it's still early over there. Um, where, are you, where are you all located, by the way? Southern California. Okay. Um, oh, that's right. That's right. And you too, Kathy? I'm in Northern California. Oh, okay. North and South. North colon SoCal. Okay. We're representing California here today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, <laughs> I think y'all the first people on our episodes to, uh, that's from California. So that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So me and Raven, we're from Dallas, but we live in the UK right now. So tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Well, I'll just start out by saying that um, the, so I'm on a mission to end world divorce. Let me just start with that. And Kathy's certainly on that mission with me. And the way we got here was uh, I had actually ruined my marriage. It started out great. And then a few years in, I just thought I had married the wrong man. We were so incompatible. We'd been going to marriage counseling uh, for years. I was so excited. He agreed to go to marriage counseling because I thought, well, now the counselor can fix him. And then I can finally be happy. So, but that's not, it turns out that's not how it works. It's not how anything works. And so of course that didn't work. And uh, so I was on the marriage counselor's gray couch when I thought, okay, I'm going to have to get divorced. There's no other option. Either I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a loveless marriage or else that I'm going to have to do this. But I was too embarrassed to get divorced. So as a last ditch effort, I started asking women who'd been happily married, I thought, for at least 15 years, what their secrets were, because that seemed like an eternity to me, like at this point, you know, I was only like six or seven years in, right. and the things they said sounded crazy to me, like didn't even make sense. I remember one woman said, uh, you know, I try not to criticize my husband, no matter how much it seems like he deserves it, and I said, well, have you got anything else? Because I, I don't think I can do that, first of all. And, uh, and I also just considered it, you know, I'm a feminist. I just thought it's my duty as a wife to like kind of question my husband and, and make sure he's thought things through and be devil's advocate. So anyway, I started doing some of the things these women had suggested. And I remember I came through the door a little while after that and his face lit up and he was happy to see me again. And that had been gone. So I thought, well, this is working because we were having either wall to wall hostility or big blow ups or cold wars all the time. And so, um, so I was pretty excited and I thought, okay, I'm now I know what to do. And it, it wasn't that hard, but it was, it was definitely new. Mm -hmm. um, but then turns out a little, not that long after that, we had a big blow up in the car again. And I was like, Oh no. Like, <laughs> and it was, and I could see like I wasn't doing what I knew I could, could do to make my relationship playful and peaceful and passionate. So I started recruiting a lot of uh, several girlfriends. I got like a little support group mm -hmm. in my living room and we started just practicing. I, I call them the intimacy skills. Now we, for, we use the connection framework and um, it really helped. These women were also reporting miracles. One woman, her husband won the sales contest at work and took her on the most romantic getaway of their lives. Right. And an, another woman said, he finally painted the family room. We've been arguing about that for months. And, <laughs> and today he said, I'm going to paint the family room. So she thought that was a miracle. And somebody said, can you write down what we're doing for my cousin in Florida? And I did. Uh, start, yeah, I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. And that became uh, The Surrender Wife, which is uh, the New York Times bestselling book that uh, has now been published in 19 languages in 30 countries and has kind of, uh, you know, I accidentally started a worldwide movement of women who wanted to fix their relationships. And uh, in fact, that includes Kathy, who found that book in the bookstore uh, and started her own journey, which I'll let her tell you about. Okay. Mm, thank you, Laura. It's true. My marriage was also struggling and I was really on the brink of divorce and a girlfriend said, maybe you can check out a book. So I went to the bookstore to buy that book and right next to that book was Laura's book. So I bought them both. 
Well, I read Laura's book in that weekend and I realized, oh my, I think I have something to do with why my marriage isn't working. It just hadn't dawned on me that I was being disrespectful or overly controlling. I had no clue about self-care. And so the concepts that Laura shared in that book were just revolutionary for me. And so I reached out to her and said, will you teach me uh, how to do these skills in my own marriage? But for some reason, I knew that day that I also wanted to help other women. Okay. And she hasn't been able to get rid of me ever since. <laughs> <laughs> you said that was 20 years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I'm happily married, saved my marriage, and it's just become my passion to empower other women because I suffered a long 10, day, 10 years in my marriage, and now I have the best marriage I could ever want. And um, it's just my honor to pay it forward and to really support this mission. Uh, it's made all the difference in my life and so many thousands of women I've been a pleasure to speak with. So it's my honor to be here today. That's great. It's in, in, shoot, we're in 2020 now and it's so easy. I feel like it's, it gets easier and easier. You find so many excuses to get a divorce now. So that's pretty awesome that you were able to, oh, that both of you, you all were able to save your marriage because a lot of people kind of, we, I wouldn't say that we're weak minded now, but I guess in lamest term, we are weak minded in the sense with all the social media and stuff, There's so many different, uh, what would you call it? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I always do this to Raven. I always look for Raven for help and she never helps me. Um, there's so many different temptations and stuff out there these days with social media and stuff. So people get all wrapped up in that and it's just so much easier for like, okay, there's another, there's a, there's other fish in the sea type thing. So, um, Back to Laura. So whenever you walked, you said you walked in, in on your husband and you said he was surprised or he had a look on his face in, in excitement. What, what, what was the reason for that? Well, I think he was happy to see me that day because, um, the, well, one of the first things that I did for, I saw I, like Kathy, I was really kind of shocked to realize I was very critical. I was really disrespectful to my husband. And uh, from my female perspective, I thought, oh, I'm being respectful because I, uh, you know, I clean up after myself. I let him know where I am and not, I like reheat his dinner, you know, when he comes home late or whatever. And I did not realize that that had nothing to do with what he considered uh, respectful. He, he wanted me to um, respect his thinking, to, to, is trust his thinking, see him as a smart man, expect the best outcome from him. And so I had started just practicing that and it felt really odd because uh, it turns out that uh, I was a really controlling person. And actually, uh, to her credit, the therapist had pointed this out. Uh, you know, you're, you're kind of controlling it. And it's like the record scratch, like, whoa, whoa, wait, we're here to fix him. <laughs> Why are you talking about me being controlling? But uh, it was a good insight, but she didn't seem to know how to help me fix that. Like she, I think she might've been controlling herself, right? She's like, just stop being controlling. And that was no help at all. Cause I thought that if I didn't, you know, kind of remind and prod and prompt that the bills weren't going to get paid and the cars weren't going to get maintained and the housework wasn't going to get done. And uh, I felt like I was the only person that was responsible for all these things. And so I think as I, um, as I began to change my behavior and really just focus on, like Kathy was saying, like, uh, we call it self-care. It's just like making myself happy every day, doing at least three things so that I feel um, like I call it the goddess of fun and light. I feel joyful yeah. and happy myself. And uh, my husband found that much more attractive than let's say the goddess of Wikipedia who knows everything and tells you <laughs> everything that, you know, you might want to know that even though you haven't asked yet. Right. I was telling you about a person that was kind of like that. that they're very controlling and they're still single to this day and not not that that's the reason why they're single but that was part of the reason because like i'm not i'm not uh very prideful myself but because when raven's right i've i agree like okay she's right about this or she's wrong about this like we're kind of half and half on that but there's one person that's just always they have to be right about everything and there's nothing wrong with her there's something wrong with everyone else mm -hmm. so um i see that being an issue with a lot of people <laughs> why, are you, why are you looking at me like that? I know who we're talking about. Yeah. Um, Kathy, did you have a moment where you realized like it clicked for your husband or you saw that, okay, he's, he's recognizing that I've changed. And did, did he have that moment for you? 
He did. It, it was the it, it was the moment that I called Laura. And I, oh, this is working. I I need her help to make sure I don't ruin it. Uh, I had walked through the door after spending a weekend reading Laura's book and had my consideration that maybe I had something to do with this. And so I came through the door after being gone for a weekend, and we had been in a cold war in a sexless marriage where I'd been sleeping in the guest room for six months. And so I really was so, so hurt that my husband just wasn't interested in me. And um, I wanted to come through that door and try something in that book to see if something could change. And so when I walked through the door, of course, he came up to me immediately and said, what should I do with the cell phone plan? Very, you know, uh, unfriendly, but neutral, right? Um, And so I said, one of the phrases that Laura teaches in the book, I was so nervous, my voice was shaking. I said, oh, whatever you think. And he (laughs) thought, where's my wife? Uh, I never had said such a thing before. And so he asked me again, no, 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 you need to tell me what to do with the cell phone plan. Again, pretty sternly. And I said, oh, whatever you think. And then I said, I trust you to make that decision for our family. Now you have to know, this was like sawdust in my mouth. I'd never said such a thing before. (laughs) And he had never heard me speak that way before. He's like, what has happened to my wife? He walks away scratching his head. And that night I decided to crawl into bed in our marital bed with him. And he reached over and put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, you were so nice today. And the tears just rolled down my face. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is the most tender moment we've had in so long. This is working. Something's working. I need to know how to do this. And it was really the beginning of my journey of continuing to practice those little phrases and those little little ways of respecting my husband. Um, Where in the past, I would have grabbed that bill right out of his hand and told him exactly how to handle that bill. (laughs) (laughs) And truth be told, the reason he was so afraid is because that's how I trained him. He had to clear everything with me. Oh, wow. And then I had all that burden on me. And then I would complain about that too. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for asking. Uh, that's a tender moment for me. I'll never forget that moment. Now you two, glo- you two look like the most sweet, sweetest woman in the world. It's hard to believe that you all were sitting over there just talking. Now I'm not saying that you're talking crazy to your husband. You don't seem, you all don't come off as the abrasive type. Well, uh, I got got a little story about that for you. It's kind of, it's a pretty embarrassing story actually. Um, So this is before we were married, actually, my husband, now my husband uh, took me on a trip to Hawaii on a getaway, romantic getaway. And I was super excited because of the first day I thought, okay, um, I want to go to the beach and it's going to be really fun. I can't wait to go to the beach. But instead of saying that I wanted to go, I I said, Hey, what do you want to do today? And he said, well, I think we should go see a volcano. And I'm like, hmm, volcano, huh? Okay. Um, I didn't want to do that, but I also didn't want to cause a conflict. It's my new boyfriend, and I just wanted to get along. So I just sort of sucked it up and didn't say anything. And so we're driving in the rental car, and you can't see the volcano for a long time. There's just little molten rocks on the side of the road. And I started to get upset, and he picked up on it, and he said, you know, what's wrong? And that's when I said, did you think this would be funny? Because I didn't think it's funny at all. I think it's really stupid. And you didn't even ask me what I wanted to do. But I wanted to go to the beach. <laughs> and so he saw a volcano, all right, but maybe not the kind he had in mind. So, um, and I, uh, you know, he took me to the beach after that, even after I behaved so badly, because he just wanted me to be happy. Mm. And this has been so interesting. You know, I've asked thousands of men now. In fact, Chris, I'll ask you okay. how important is it to you that Raven's happy? Uh, it's pretty important. I feel like it's important because if she's not happy, then it's just, I don't know. I feel like there's tension in the house and I kind of, I don't really like tension in my own house. So it's important that she's happy and I can tell she didn't think I know. Well, I don't know. Raven's kind of weird because she has this look on her face to where you can't really tell if she's happy or not because sometimes I and excuse my language and I don't like to use this word, but you ever heard you, I'm sure you heard the word, the rest in bitch face. Oh yeah. Okay. 
I don't, we don't, we don't use that word in our house and I, I don't never say that word. So it's, uh, it makes me uncomfortable saying it, but that's what, that's the best way I can put it. She would have, she has that face all the time. So it's kind of hard to tell whether she's upset or not. So I ask her and it kind of irritates her sometimes too. when I do ask her if she's okay. So I check to make sure she's okay. So I would say, yeah, I do care if she's happy or not. Right. Care a lot. Sounds like. Yeah, I, tr- I try. I try. Yeah. She might not look at her. <laughs> she may not feel that way, but I care. I just have my own way of caring, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, I love that answer because uh, I've asked thousands of men and they all say the same thing that, oh. that you just said. So it's, it's, they say, well, yeah, it's really important. Some people, some guys will say it's the most important thing. And in the UK, they usually say it's imperative, but you guys are from Dallas, so I'll let that one go. <laughs> yeah, I gotta use it. It's imperative. It's imperative. <laughs> imperative. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, lo- so I love the UK language. Yeah. What were you about to say? You were about to say something. I, I was just gonna say, it's always been fun to just see, because uh, I think when my marriage was at its low point, I didn't think my husband cared about my happiness at all. And that wasn't true. It was how. I was showing up as a porcupine wife, right? With the disrespect and the criticism and the control. And so that kind of superseded his desire to make sure I was happy. And um, now that I've, um, yeah, now I can really see like that guy's just, he'll trip over himself to try to do whatever he thinks will make me happy now. Like a, a good example was I used to go around, I didn't, know how to express my desires obviously from the volcano story you can see that but um <laughs> so i used to go around just complaining i remember i would say john this kitchen's a disaster and i thought he was gonna jump off the couch and then start doing the dishes but that never happened mm. and it wasn't until i figured out that he wanted to make me happy and all i had to do was tell him how and i was just complaining you know and when you complain i don't think men can really hear i think he just heard john blah 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 but then finally, I just said, you know, I would love a clean kitchen. He goes, okay, I'm, I'm going to do the dishes. And he's been doing them ever since. And that was like 20 years ago. I don't do the dishes at all anymore. <laughs> so it was really fun to see how much he really just wanted to make me happy. <laughs> Chris, I would love a clean kitchen. Raven, I would too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that cleans the kitchen. <laughs> I'll just, oh, you clean the kitchen your house? Wait, no, listen, the key, listen, the key listen. The word here was, she said, and she has not touched the dishes ever since. And I thought, wow. So that's why. Raven touches <laughs> a dish maybe every once in a while. She might touch one dish a day. But if it was up to her, she would let them pile up all day. And I like I don't like dishes in the sink, but that's a whole different story for another day. And she's trying to she tried to get ahead of it because she knew I was about to say something about it. <laughs> she thinks she's smart. Cute. Yeah, it's not that cute, actually. No, <laughs> I'm joking. So, Kathy, what is your husband like? Um, is he kind of the same way? Um, is he like tripping over everything, trying to do everything he can for you? He sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Things have gotten as good as I can stand over here. In fact, I was just telling Laura, like, how much better is this going to get? <laughs> It's probably as good as that wine that's been aging, Raven, that you're enjoying right there. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he does dishes and every single thing that I can imagine uh, wanting done and more. It's really lightened my load a lot. And um, yeah, his number one goal is making me happy. I mean, you can see right here, this is this has been the result of practicing the skills is really the happier I get, the, the better life we have. Uh-oh. In all areas, uh, parenting, abundance, um, just family life and work also. Um, it's really had a ripple effect. Right. So, yes, he's tripping over himself, including today. He knows I'm on this. And he's like, okay, I won't, I won't do the blowing outside. <laughs> the, oh, <laughs> I know got, you need quiet. He, he loves blowing the, blow, blowing the yard so he can have a pretty house and a pretty front yard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's good. Um, so, Laura, going back to I did a little research on you and you were and you said that um, that you felt that you were the perfect wife until you got married. So what is it that makes women think that they're the perfect wife until they do get married? Gosh, Chris, what a great question, because it is interesting. It does seem to be a theme because I thought I was the only person struggling my marriage. But then 
I found out there's lots of us, uh, you know, women have really come out of the woodwork in every language and every country in the world to uh, say the same thing. Like, I feel like I married the wrong man. My husband's the one with the problem. He's the one that um, drinks too much, or he's the one that has the terrible temper, or, you know, there's serious problems too, right? He's the one that uh, cheated on me. He's the one that is uh, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive. And uh, so it's an interesting phenomenon. We see that again and again, that we women feel like we're the good spouse. And, uh, and usually we're the ones also trying to get him to go to counseling, uh, to marriage counseling. And uh, the theme that we're seeing again and again is that it doesn't work. Uh, in fact, most people come, they arrive on our campus, they've already been through marriage counseling, and either it made things worse or it just didn't didn't help them solve the problem. And, and usually it was her idea mm -hmm. that they go. It's, he was kind of reluctant to go if, if he, or he or refused to go. And so part of the promise, uh, you know, the miracles that we see on our campus is that women can fix their relationships without his conscious effort. He doesn't even have to know that she's doing anything. A lot of women uh, sign up kind of on the sly. They'll, they'll, you know, come into a program and, they just, you know, they put that on that other credit card that he doesn't see or whatever. And then he just, he just says to her like, oh, like someone was just uh, sharing with me the other day that she overheard her husband saying to their son, yeah, mom's a lot happier lately. I don't know why. So it's just a mystery to him, but he, but she, she can see, you know, it's nice for her to get the validation. He could see the, the difference in her, but you ask a great question. I don't really know the answer about why. Um, you know, why I was so self-righteous at the beginning of my marriage, thinking I was the, the good spouse. Um, but it was a very humbling experience to find out, wow, I really wasn't. Yeah. Did both of you grow up with both of your parents? That's a great question. Kathy, you want to take that one first? I, <clears throat> I did grow up with both of my parents, although they did divorce after I had left home, after their, just the shy of their 25th wedding anniversary. So it wasn't a, a happy marriage or a good role model at all for, for marriage. The whole, the whole 25 years? The whole time they were married. It was not a pleasant oh, situation. Wow. Yeah, it was hard. So I asked that question because I was wondering if those, if you, maybe you both were a certain way, maybe those were learned behaviors that you brought into your own marriage. Do you think that might be something that yeah. may attest to that? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I didn't have any other, and they don't teach us this stuff in school, how to be successful in relationships. Right. And uh, so I, I had only had my parents, my grandparents seemed to be happily married, but not a lot of passion. They're pretty modest and uh, didn't really ex exude uh, passion or, or uh, physical affection all that much with my grandparents, but they, I didn't see any fighting. Right. That was the closest role model that I had. Okay. I was thinking of your earlier question of Laura, you know, when I was dating Doug, I was just like all happy and sweet and everything he said was so smart. But as yeah. soon as I got married, it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I just remember that, that, that early stage when I was trying to, you know, find, find my next husband uh, because I did fail in my first marriage. I didn't have that training. I didn't have any examples and I sure didn't want to fail a second time. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I just remember, you know, uh, that shift between being really sweet and nice and then not so nice and sweet mm -hmm. after the marriage. Why does that happen? Why do people get married? Why, why is it that everything is so cool right before they get married and then all of a sudden when they put up that ring on each other's finger, then things start to change after a while? Like, is it, is it going to happen regardless whether they get married or not? Or is it something about marriage that makes people act a certain way? I think it's expectations. Like the second that we know we are committed to each other, it's like, okay, well, here are all these expectations that I had of a person that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Hmm. And so they just, I think it's one of those things where, oh, I got the ring now. Here are the expectations. And a lot of people are just like, wait, that, that's not how you were. Why is it that you've changed suddenly hmm. after a ring? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think... I think there's some truth to that. I, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting is how, how, like Kathy just described, right? We're so happy when we first fall in love. And then pretty soon, like you look at your partner and you think, wow, that, 
that's a that's a pro that needs to be fixed. We got to work on that one or whatever. And I've just been amazed at what a personal spiritual journey it's been to to fix my marriage because I thinking going from thinking it was all him to really having to look at my side of the street and have all of my flaws be on display so so big, right? I mean that example in Hawaii where I just flew into a rage like that, that's not, that wasn't the last time that happened, right? I did it lots of times. And my wonderful patient, long suffering husband, never said he was going to leave me. Uh, but I did. I, I said it all the time. I was like, maybe we should just get divorced. You know, I was like threatening um, the very foundation of our, of our commitment to each other a lot. And um, so it's, it's been very, uh, I, I would say it's like the best self-improvement program I ever undertook was trying to fix my marriage because it really was like my husband was my mirror and then I could see all these mm -hmm. things, all the times that I was um, acting in fear instead of choosing my faith, you know, like having to tell him, hey, don't take the freeway right now because we'll, we won't get there on time so you better just take service streets or whatever. It's like, yeah, like I, I can't trust him to be a grown man who can like get us from point A to B in the car because uh, I'm afraid, right? I'm always afraid of something and that's what control is all about. So, you know, you don't have to tell him like, hey, a family Ford's not going to fit in a, in a sports car if you're not afraid he's going to buy the wrong car and you don't have to tell him how to dress or what to eat or anything else if you're not afraid. And so it was really a journey of choosing my faith instead of my fear in my husband. And that turned out to be a metaphor for choosing my faith, I guess, in the universe, really, uh, in life. Like when I stopped focusing on him, mm. my own life emerged, you know, like I, I had been driving down the street with like no one at the wheel, you know, feigning an injury, trying to get some attention because nobody was paying attention to my life. But then, you know, I stopped, I gave up controlling his being the armchair quarterback of his. And I got to write a, a best selling book. I got to uh, go on national media. I, I got to uh, start a coaching organization. I, I speak in front of uh, live audiences and all of that was terrifying. You know, it was scary, but I felt like uh, choosing my faith in my marriage was practice for that. So it ended up really um, giving me a, a richer life all around. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so I saw that you have the six intimacy skills. I noticed that that was trademarked. So is that something that you all came up with or that you came up with or? Yeah. So back to those women that I was, you know, that I interviewed and I asked questions of, I remember thinking they were going to say, well, you just have to, you know, you have to pick a good guy. And they just totally didn't say that. They, uh, they gave me these insights. Like one woman said that she had her husband um, manage all the finances for them. Like she just deposited her check into the joint account and he handled it from there, retirement savings and, you know, school tuition or whatever. And the whole thing. And she said, that was a real relief for me. That's been really great. And that was another thing where I thought, Oh, that is, you know, that sounds crazy. Like I am a modern woman and I make my own money. Like I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I was more like here, John, give me your paycheck. Okay. Now I'll, handle it all. And uh, it, it turns out it was just another area where I had a ton of fear. I walked into my marriage uh, on day one with a ton of fear of financial insecurity. And that manifested itself in me trying to control the money. And so I was amazed that um, when I relinquished control of the finances and did start to trust my husband, that we actually uh, became more prosperous. He, he uh, started his own business uh, around that time and became um, he more successful than he'd ever been at any job before that. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like me deciding to trust, even though it was scary for me, really created a, a much better outcome. So that, that's, that's one example um, of the mm -hmm. kinds of intimacy skills that I, I didn't have a role model. Kathy didn't have a role model because my parents are divorced, her parents are divorced. So, um, and I think it's relationships are a lot like driving a car or making an omelet. Like if somebody shows you, then you know how to do it. And if you don't, right. then how would you know? So yeah. it's been really great to just have that framework to, uh, you know, like, and, and they were really specific things that I decided I wanted to know if I'd really done them or not. Like with self care, making yourself happy, it's three things a day. I have, you know, and I can check them off on a list. Like I did three things today just for frivolous fun, just to make Laura feel good. That was the only purpose for them. 
Um, and, and each of the six intimacy skills has that kind of a framework where you can say, yeah, I did it. Or no, I didn't do that one today. <laughs> and that, you know, that's going to happen too. Okay. Yeah. So going in, you just said something that kind of brought me back somewhere. So you said that, um, either you said relationships are kind of like driving the car or making an omelet. So we don't know how to have a relationship unless we are showed how to do that. Right. So, I mean, you obviously got to learn, you got to learn the, the, the base frame on how to have a relationship. And that's the main thing when it comes, when it comes to relationship is communication. But a lot of people, they will try to, let's say like me and Raven, like my, my parents are still married to this day, but I can't love Raven the same way my dad loves my mom because that might not work for Raven. Not saying that that's what we do, but that might not work for Raven. So I think some people, and that's why I asked that question earlier about um, if you if your parents were together or if they were divorced or not, because maybe you t- took that learned behavior and tried to take them to your own marriage, and you found out that that same way that you were loving your husband didn't work for you, didn't work for you and your husband. So that was interesting that you said that. But it's always good to have that good base. Um, so um, you have several, you have published several books. I noticed. So I googled your name, and a whole bunch of books came up. I was like, oh, okay, we're talking to an author, author, like of the New York's best time selling author. So what would you say is your favorite? What was your favorite book to write? Was it this one that we that we've been talking about the whole time, or the Empowered Wife, which is. Oh. Six Surprising Secrets to Attracting Your Husband's Time, Attention, and Affection okay. is definitely my favorite. It's my newest one. So I don't know if it's always that, like with mothers, I think, right? The little baby, right? It's like your favorite. Um, but I am, um, yeah, I'm just really, uh, I feel proud that I was able to just write out those six intimacy skills in a way that anybody could open the book. And, and this is what happens. Many women do open the book and say, I, I, for the first time I knew exactly what to do. It was super practical. I had a, I had a game plan in each situation. Uh, and that's, that's what that book does. And, and yeah, we, we get a lot of feedback that it's, it's very life changing. The first book also, uh, had that effect on like on Kathy (laughs) who's nodding her head. Right. And, uh, (laughs) but it was, um, it, it was gratifying to have been in the trenches with so many real women because after that first book, so many thousands of women reached out to me. And then uh, I used what I learned, you know, over that time to make the most recent book. So that's my favorite. That's the one you should start with is The Empowered Wife. The Empowered Wife. Okay. Kathy, question for you. What is the word, like, what does Empowered Wife means to you? What does that mean? It's a great question. Empowered Wife means I get to decide what fits for me and make a choice that's going to uh, support my desire to be dignified, to really be my best self, to really create peace and harmony in my home and in my family. Uh, it's really my guiding light is to be the best I can be in my family, in my marriage, in my work relationships, in my neighborhood. I just want to be the best woman I can be where I'm minding my own business, (laughs) tending to my own happiness and really just being grateful. Um, So being an empowered wife means I get get to decide. I actually have a choice. I don't have to react. I can actually pause and say, you know, how do I want to respond to this situation? Or what do I want to be given the circumstances here? You know, there's a lot going on in the world and I'm choosing my faith over my fear every day. Okay. Uh, thanks to these skills. Um, I can always look at the glass as being half full or half empty. And so the empowered wife helps me look at the half full part of the glass. Right. Yeah. Good. Great question. Okay. What does empowered wife mean to you, Raven? You don't like being put on the spot I like don't. that. <laughs> 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 all right. So, um, Kathy and Laura, so you both work. So you all, I mean, so one of them, so you're from North Cal and, uh, and the, Kathy's from South Cal or Laura's from Other South way. Cal. Right. Yeah. So you all work together and like, how do you all, how do you all work together? Can you explain that? Sure. We work. Yeah, we, we work virtually. We okay. just, in fact, we're, we're longtime Zoom users. So this is a very comfortable platform for us to be on today with your podcast. All the coaches, since they're all over the world, uh, we couldn't possibly have a physical building that would serve everyone. We have a hard time finding time zones that serve everyone because we have um, 
people in Europe like you guys, and we have women in Australia and Asia, and of course in the United States. So um, it's, uh, but it's been a great experience to have a virtual company. And, and as Kathy was talking about earlier, part of being an empowered wife is really like, what fits for me? Like, what's going to serve me today? What's going to help me show up as my best self? How am I going to avoid getting overtaxed or overstressed so that, and which is when usually, you know, that, that uh, woman comes out, right? The one that we don't want to be like, I didn't like hearing myself talk when I was nagging and controlling and complaining (laughs) like that. So, uh, so one of the things that we do company wide is everybody really has to tend to that. Like we all have to choose what fits for us. Uh, And so our company has been designed uh, and Kathy runs it beautifully where there's just a ton of flexibility for the coaches. Each time we will say, Hey, we have a new client for you. Do you want to, do you want to take one? And they get to say yes or no, if it fits for them, like, okay, no, I've already got enough clients. I'm good. And a lot of, a lot of coaches will say that or other times um, uh, people will say, Hey, I want to come closer. I want to do more. Uh, I want to make this my livelihood and we're able to accommodate that as well. So it's been, uh, it's really kind of an amazing thing. We like cry at work together. I mean, we'll like get on zoom and like somebody will have a story of like the, you know, her husband had left, he was with another woman and, um, and now he's moved back. And we just like, we all, you know, we all have, we keep our Kleenex really close because we're, um, yeah, we cry at work. Okay. Oh, so you allow yourself, so you allow yourselves to get emotional with the clients as well. Definitely. Okay. Because really. usually you'll ha- you'll have some. Not that I've I haven't never really sat down with a counselor or anything like that before. I'm actually a counselor myself, and me, I'm not allowed to show emotion. I have to be neutral. Um, but I also work in a different field. I don't work in relationship field. I work in equal opportunity type thing, or really? human resources. Yeah. So I'm a, I, I'm an equal opportunity counselor. Um. So I'm not allowed to show emotion. So it was weird when I hear therapist or something or someone saying that they can show emotion or they can sit there and cry with someone so that's different you know yeah but that's awesome yeah, we, we cry every day yeah <laughs> every day, yeah. <laughs> every day. Oh, yeah. yeah i think that's one of the things i love about being a relationship coach distinct from a counselor for example they're vastly different approaches obviously um and I never knew if any marriage counselor that I had had the marriage that I wanted. And one of the things that all of our coaches have is the marriage that our clients want. And so we're, we're ideally placed to support her getting from where she's at to where she wants to be because we were once where she was, where she is. Okay. Y'all didn't, that's awesome that you work in zoom too. So y'all, y'all didn't miss Y'all didn't skip a beat whenever the COVID <laughs> and stuff started happening. No, right. Exactly. That's right. We, we were, we've been, we been doing this. I love, I love working from home now. I need yeah. To, I need to, yeah, I need to figure out how to do this for the rest of my life mm. or until, until it's time to retire. It'd be nice. Yes. It is wonderful. So you, are you able to do the equal opportunity interviews over zoom now? I bet. Uh, kind of some things require me to go in to do work, but for the most part, I can do most of my work from home. But there is a time when you need that face to face because you can't have certain conversations. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's a whole different story. This is y'all's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to ask. Um, one more question. So, whenever people have you ever had a couple come to you or a woman or a female come to you, and they there's not ne- nothing actually wrong with them. Like, is there people that that, that just come just to exercise a relationship? Um, communications. I don't, know if, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but is there is there like anyone that comes just for I guess maintenance, just for relationship maintenance, <laughs> or do some people just people just come to you with problems? I think the range is pretty broad. Uh, we have women who really want to uh, restore the intimacy that has been lost, and there's other women who really that like the sizzle is gone. There's no crisis. But they, they're not, um, yeah, like they're more like roommates. So I wouldn't say it's a crisis situation, but they're getting along fine. And she would love to be exploring things that make her happy. And this whole concept of self-care and becoming happy and 
pursuing her own desires. I think it's a, a real exciting time for wives who find out about Laura's work and think, huh, I didn't even know that there was that possibility for me to, this is just the norm, how it is. And so right. she finds maybe Laura's podcast or a blog and she, they, she thinks, I want some of that. I want some of that uh, yeah. <laughs> fun and light back into my home. Yeah. And we're happy to support her taking her marriage from where it is to where she wants to go. So it okay. is different for every wife. And I don't think everyone is in crisis for sure. Okay. Awesome. Did you have any questions that you want to ask Raven? So concerning the six intimacy skills, what do you feel is the most, was the most beneficial to you? Or if there's one that you wish you could tell any woman that feels like, I need to improve my relationship. What is that one that you were like, if, if I had just wanted to tell you, this is the one that I would choose to, to share with you? Well, I will say that I would always start her out with the happiness one because almost everybody that comes to our campus is pretty depleted, doesn't know what makes her happy anymore. Maybe she's been devoting herself to the kids and the family and her job. And um, But I will say that for me, my very favorite intimacy skill is um, the spouse fulfilling prophecy, we call it. I, and this is the how to change your husband skill. And I'll just tell, uh, it's, in my situation, one of the things that I was unwittingly doing was, um, and remember I had fear of financial insecurity. I was telling my husband things like, hey, maybe you could ask for a raise. Maybe you could try to get a job that pays better. Maybe you could try to make more money. I think you should try to make more money. And of course the subtext of that is you don't make enough money. It's a criticism, right? So we got to the point where my husband didn't make any money. He quit his job. And uh, I was like enraged about that. I was so uh, fearful and just unhappy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I got this insight actually from Lee Miltier uh, taught me about this. The I've never met her, but I listened to her, uh, you know, talking about the power of uh, affirmation and auto suggestion. And she tells the story of this woman who comes to her class and learns about auto-suggestion and realizes that she's auto-suggesting to her husband something she didn't want. And so this woman was telling her husband that he always lost his temper. And so she went to Lee's class and decided she was going to just change that up completely because what could it hurt to just experiment? So she just went home. She waited for her husband to lose his temper and she didn't have to wait very long. And as soon as he did, she said, that's not like you lose your temper. And he looked at her funny and their 12 year old son said, yes, it is mom. He always loses his temper because mm -hmm. he'd been listening to her affirm that he lost his temper a lot. But so she stuck to her guns. She just kept every time he loses his temper, she'd just say, that's not like you. So they're at a restaurant not too long after and the service is slow and the guy starts to fume and he's like, I got to get mine. Call the manager over here and tell him how long we've been waiting. And he stops himself and he looks at her and he says, that's not like me to lose my temper like that, is it? So she just about fell out of her chair. So I, I heard this story and I thought, okay, I, I got to try this. And so I came up with my spouse fulfilling prophecy for my husband was, um, and it felt true-ish that he'd always been a good provider. And then also just for fun, I decided to start calling him Mr. Moneybags because that was the experience I wanted to have, right? Not the one I was having. So I started saying that like, yeah, you've always been a good provider and, and uh, you know, Hey, you get a check in the mail. I go, oh, Hey, Mr. Moneybags or whatever. <laughs> and, um, anyway, that's around the time that he did start that business. That was very successful when I started using that spouse fulfilling prophecy. And I think the illusion is like, Oh, well he changed, you know, he's now, you know, he makes more money, but I really think that it was me who changed, you know, my, um, my expectations, my, what I was focusing on, um, you know, the, it's the magic of gratitude in a way, right? Just focusing on the things that I wanted to be experiencing instead of what I didn't want. Uh, and so we see just absolute miracles happen when women um, kind of give up the old story that they have and start gathering evidence that their husband is the way, the thing, the experience that they want to be having. Uh, so that was that would definitely be my favorite skill. And to this day, I still call him Mr. Moneybags. And to, mm. it very now. <laughs> <laughs> he does really well. <laughs> so. yeah. It's the money bags. I like that name. You gonna start calling me Mr. Moneybags? No? Okay. One day. <laughs> <laughs> Told y'all we are goofy. So um is there anything else that you would like to add? Any of you? Well, 
I guess just to say that if there's, um, you know, for a woman who's listening, that feels like her marriage is probably beyond. Like she thinks, oh, that's nice for Laura. That's nice for Kathy that she, you know, that we, they were able to fix their marriages. And how nice that Ray and Chris have such a good marriage. And they've never even been to counseling, you know, so you guys um, seem pretty, pretty solid. But, uh, she, you know, I, I just hear it again and again that women think, oh, but it's, it's hopeless for me. You know, my situation is hopeless. And um, gosh, that's what we all thought. We all thought that our marriages were hopeless. Our husbands were hopeless. Our problems were too big. And uh, it's just a joy to be on our campus and seeing women um, really overcoming those problems and feeling so successful and proud that they're able to fix their marriages single-handedly. So I just invite them to come and uh, we have a, a roadmap, actually free. It's called the Adored Wife Roadmap mm -hmm. that you can download on our website to uh, get started on that journey. Okay. Any last words, Kathy? Just what a pleasure it is to share my story and really to reach uh, women who may be hurting and thinking about what they can do to become an empowered wife. So thanks for the opportunity and uh, really would love to invite all women to check out Laura's free roadmap. It's, it's really a wonderful place to get started. Okay. Awesome. So do you all have any Instagram pages or I know you have your podcast, the empowered podcast, but is there any Instagram page or any other podcasts or books or whatever that you want to recommend for people to, for our listeners to get a hold of you? Well, another way that they can easily join in the conversation is we have a, a Facebook group, a private group uh -huh. that they can join called the adored wife. And so that's free. And, um, yeah, there's 12,000 members strong and, uh, we're just, yeah, that's always growing. The okay. adored wife. Yeah. All right. Cool. Raven, anything else? Last things? Um, for those that are single and they're wondering, are it, is it beneficial for them to also read your books before they get into a marriage or have expectations of a marriage? Yeah, that's a great question. So I do have a book called the surrendered single. And it's about attracting and marrying the man who's right for you. But it's interesting. It goes both ways. We have singles reading the empowered wife. We have uh, w married women reading the surrendered single to learn how to attract their husband back to them. Um, so it really, for me, it was a, it's a lot about my power as a woman and why that's so attractive to men and uh, not, not trying to make myself a smaller, less hairy man, but really kind of honoring that feminine spirit. So, um, so it certainly is beneficial when you're in the phase of wanting to attract that right partner for you to know about your feminine gifts and your feminine power. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Ooh, I almost forgot. So the name of our podcast is the Plubic Therapy Podcast. So I always asked our guest, what is one thing that you do that's therapeutic that helps you get through the day? Great question. Uh, so I, so one thing that I do that's therapeutic and helps me get through the day, you know, the first answer that came to mind was I play volleyball usually on Saturdays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, but I can't do that right now because of COVID. Right. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't been doing that. So I guess the thing that's helping me get through the day is um, right now I'm uh, doing uh, beach body uh, exercise yeah. videos uh, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Okay. And uh, I don't like them as much, but uh, boy, it sure helps me <laughs> feel a lot better <laughs> yeah. that I do that. So, yeah. Okay. What about you, Kathy? I'm jumping on a mini trampoline and I have a nice canister of dark chocolate. Those are my two favorites. Okay. <laughs> so do you eat the can of dark chocolate and then go jump on the trampoline? Okay. Pre-workout. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I actually heard that that's a really good workout and it's one of the healthier forms of cardio to, to actually jump on the trampoline. So that's, that's awesome. All right. So Laura, Kathy, I appreciate you all for jumping on the Public Therapy Podcast. This has been a great episode. And yeah, so our listeners know how to contact you. So I appreciate you all for coming. So this has been another episode of the Public Therapy Podcast with your host, Chris. And Ray. All right, y'all. Bye. Bye.